Pound opens on the east end to the Atlantic. And in colonial days, that was the main port for ships crossing the Atlantic. And uh, it, the, the custom houses got burned down repeatedly, uh, including by Benedict Arnold during the Revolutionary War, the 1780s. And so when New London was in its heyday, which is to say the early um, 19th century, it was the second leading whaling port in the world after New Bedford and uh, for several decades. And the leaders of the town said, we want a uh, fireproof customs house. And so they wrote to uh, Alexander Hamilton, the treasury, and said, who, who can do it, you know, we want this building. And they sent Robert Mills, who was, uh, he worked with Thomas Jefferson on the design of the White House. He designed other federal buildings in DC, but he designed our very beautiful uh, custom house. And this is his sketch for it. He made a folio, quite a large folio of drawings, and it was not exactly a blueprint but it was the general idea for how the custom house should be built. And that same folio was used for the New Bedford custom house, which opened the next year, and the Newburyport custom house, which is now a nice museum also, and also for a custom house in Middletown that no longer exists. Um, one of the things I want to say is that uh, our, our museum, I was saying I'm the only employee we're very much uh, run by committed volunteers, wonderful volunteers. And when the Custom House was deemed a surplus government building in the 1980s, the citizens of New London rallied and said they wanted to uh, preserve the building for the city. So they petitioned the federal government and the Custom House building was given to New London for one dollar, and then they had to figure out what to do with it, and then they created the Maritime Museum. But it's important to realize that our roots go to historic preservation, and it's a very strong part of what we do. We may be a small group, but we are really committed to historic preservation. Um, so here we are today, we have a great museum shop. There's our little museum. It's, uh, it's a wonderful place two new buoys out front. Um, this, if you remember the opening picture, this is what the uh, lighthouse looked like exactly one year ago. The lighthouse, uh, when, I, when I got to the New London Maritime Society, it was to take over sort of a sleepy little museum, that museum building. And many years before, in fact, about seven years before that, the uh, society had applied to take on a lighthouse, the uh, New London Harbor Light. It's the oldest lighthouse on Long Island Sound. It's the tallest, it's beautiful classic shape. And in fact, the original lighthouse on this spot was built under King George III in 1761. So a very important building um, in the same way that our Custom House was deemed a surplus structure. They have decided that um, the federal government no longer wants to be responsible for lighthouses. And even though they are still used and are still important aids to navigation, they have uh, decided that they're not that critical. And I think if you're out there in a boat in a storm and you're trying to you know, get somewhere, having the light there is pretty critical, but they believe that uh, GPS has replaced all of that. But at the Maritime Society, we decided, well, we would take responsibility for this lighthouse, and it took many years for the federal government to actually turn it over, which they did about five years ago. So this is the first lighthouse we adopted um, and here we are entering it for the first time. That's our former board president, Ben Martin. 
when we went inside with the Coast Guard, now the Coast Guard maintains all the lights in the lighthouses, and they still do. They have access, they maintain the lights, but they are not, you know, building maintenance companies. Uh, so that's where we come in, and we are now responsible for all the uh, actual physical condition of the lighthouse. But when this man took us uh, up inside the lighthouse, he mentioned that the Coast Guardsmen who take care of Long Island Sound were talking, and they thought that from the top of this lighthouse, you could see more lighthouses than from any place on Earth. That was like a, you know, being a former newspaper person. I got that uh, sort of imprinted in my mind because that's a great claim. And it's not that New London has more lighthouses than anyone else. It's just the ge geological formation on the edge looking at the islands, right? So we have our lighthouse. We have uh, Avery Point on the other side of the Thames River. Looking out, there are several islands, Little Gull, uh, North Dumpling, and, and then you can see all the way over to Montauk, actually. So when you add them up, we can see, at, particularly at night, seven different lighthouses from that one spot, Ledge Lighthouse. So that gave us a little bit of a tagline we could put on the lighthouse. And as I said, the museum had been a sleepy little museum, but once we got the lighthouse, we decided it couldn't be just us taking care of it. We had to make it a community project. We started a program called Lighthouse Kids. We bring all the kids in the schools up into the lighthouse. They learn about uh, the New London Harbor, aids to navigation, the geology I was just talking about, and lighthouses, and they absolutely love it. And they, we make them ambassadors to go out, tell other people about it. They learn their nautical knots. It's a wonderful program. In uh, uh, 2011, the first year we had the lighthouse, we did a, a Sentinels in the Sound weekend. It's our very first weekend to try to bring together the region's lighthouses. That's a picture of the ledge of ledge light, uh, which is in New London Harbor. It was one weekend, and uh, we were so happy. We we did. Boat, boat trips out to the lighthouses. And when it rained on Sunday and we had to cancel the boat, trap, boat trips, we were so happy <laughs> because we were so exhausted. But I will say, um, now for 2015, we're doing actually 19 weeks of lighthouse activities. Boat trips, not just on the weekends, but all the time, and it's uh, it's grown into be a really it's grown to be something we not one can manage, and two people love and really look forward to. And last year, just at this time, Yankee Magazine did a Best of New England issue, and we won Best Lighthouse Tours, so that's pretty great. Um, here are there's there's the lighthouse, and here are some people touring around looking at it. We do not own the house next to it. I'll tell you one funny story, which is funny, if not funny at all, but the first year we put in a temporary, well, we had people land by water, so the neighbor over here called DEEP and uh, everybody they could so that we couldn't bring our boat in, although we had the perfect right to do it, but to be good neighbors we stopped. Then the people, uh, the person who lived in this house, who was always very friendly, died, and a relative moved in. Now they're uh, threatening to not have us have access by land through our easement. We're in the midst of horrible, uh, difficult discussions with them because, you know, it is when you take on a lighthouse from the federal government, you promise to do two things. You promise to maintain the structure, do the historic preservation, but you also promise to provide access to the public. It's like we're a little national park. And why not? Your money built the lighthouse. You have maintained it all these years. We're a, we're a nonprofit. Of course, that's what the... But now the neighbors on the other side, you can see just the edge of their swimming pool, uh, have sued us because they didn't like that we brought the school children in. New London, the school children are so poor, we don't have buses. They walked from their school. They walked more than a mile to get here last fall. And now our thanks for that is the neighbors are suing us. So 
it's not, you know, the lighthouses are great, but it's really tough. We can't come by water. We can't go by our easement. We can't go in the path we built on our own property because we're being threatened by someone with lots of money who thinks they can wear us down. But we are a tough little group. We are small, but we are tough, and we are very, very fortunate that the firm Robinson and Cole, who you may know, good shoreline defenders and lawyers have taken us on as a pro bono case. So we're, we're lucky. Um, not long after we adopted the lighthouse, Superstorm Sandy hit. And you saw it didn't look all that bad in that first picture when we were going up to the lighthouse with the Coast Guardsmen. After Superstorm Sandy, the walkway to the lighthouse got all washed out. The, the retaining wall, uh, a spider web of cracks. So we had a little bit of a delay while we went through FEMA, but FEMA actually helped us repair many parts of the lighthouse, and uh, all of that work also was done last year. Um, at the same time, another lighthouse came up for adoption, and this one is uh, a big favorite. Uh, it's uh, Race Rock. Race Rock is right off of Fisher's Island was offered first, the, the process with the federal government is you have a surplus lighthouse. There is something called the Lighthouse Protection Act of 2000. And people who were in the Coast Guard or sailors who had relied upon the lighthouse, lighthouses did not like the fact when they were deemed surplus, the government could sell them and someone could put in like a fish restaurant or something. They thought they were you know, uh, important historical sites that meant a lot to many mariners over the years. So the Lighthouse Protection Act of 2000 said, okay, first the federal government will offer the lighthouse to the municipality. They have first refusal. Well, they never take it on, really. Then it's offered to nonprofits. And we applied for this lighthouse in the same way we had applied for New London Harbor Light. And there were about five other groups that were interested at that time because this is one of the spots with the uh, greatest potential for uh, tidal energy creation. There were some people applying who I think had uh, commercial interests in mind. So here we were again, our little group against some really pretty powerful organizations, but we had done such a good job uh, with our education program, which I touched on a little bit, that we actually received Race Rock Lights. Now we had two lighthouses as of 2013. Um, Race Rock, you might say, well, it's off of Fisher's Island. Fisher's Island is three miles from um, New London. However, the ferry dock that uh, serves Fisher's Island, New York, is in New London. And Fisher's Island was a part of New London for the early part of our history. It was owned by John Winthrop. And he actually traded it for land down this way in Fairfield County. It was uh, the lighthouse was built by a New London uh, person, uh, uh, Captain uh, T.A. Scott. And this shows, there he is right in the middle with the top hat, the, the tall man right in the middle. He's sort of like New London's Paul Bunyan. There are many, many stories about him risking his life. A ferry boat had a hole in the side. He jumped onto the ferry boat and put his hip in the hole in the freezing water and allowed all these people to be rescued. You know, he did many wonderful things. And one of the most wonderful is in seven years in that stormy, turbulent water known as the race, he built the foundation, and then in seven months, the lighthouse itself. So, um, so that so we you know we said yeah we got to have race rock. So we do. I don't know if any of you get National Geographic television, but they uh, recently filmed out there, and it was shown uh, last month. It's a little bit uh, a macabre sort of a reality show. Is not very real, but they did some beautiful photography of the lighthouse. Um, at the same time, we no sooner got our application in for Race Rock than Little Gull Lighthouse, which is my personal favorite, at the other end of the race. The race is where Long Island Sound opens out to the Atlantic. Um, Little Gull had been given to a nonprofit through the process I described, 
and they did not live up to their obligations. So the federal government took it back. And they have a series of steps that they go through where you cannot backtrack in the process. So our organization said, listen, we would be happy to take on Little Gull. Um, can we take over from the other nonprofit? And they said, absolutely not. Um, we offer it once to a nonprofit. If that doesn't work, it goes up for auction. So Little Gull was put up for auction. And uh, after we had a massive letter writing campaign, we had all sorts of wonderful people write in from all along Long Island Sound. Government said, no, we're just starting the auction. So in 24 hours, we raised $165,000 with an on, you know, online campaign. And we bid on the lighthouse. And we were in the lead for 10 minutes. And it sold for $365,000 to a private individual. The private individual is, um, seems to be very uh, conservation, preservation minded. You know, time will tell. And if he gives it to his kids, who knows what happens. But we think it's important. You know, we really do try to maintain the lighthouses, you know, for the public. And uh, we'll see what happens with Little Gull. This was our campaign. After a couple of years, in 2013, we decided to, uh, that we had to repaint the lighthouse. You saw what it would look like. It was be part of something big. And this is a very well-beloved uh, painting that's at the Lyman Allen Museum. Actually, they've loaned it to, our, to us for a couple of years. But that's a picture of New London Harbor Light around uh, 1910 or so. And you see all the people milling around on the grounds. In the old days, when the lighthouses were run by the US Lighthouse Service, it was an obligation for the lighthouse keeper to show people around the lighthouses if they weren't otherwise occupied with you know, foghorns and things. And um, that's part of why the Lighthouse Protection Act has that access component to it. And here we are on an open house day uh, twice a year. And you're welcome to come. It's going to be, I think, June 27th and September maybe 17th. The press release just went out yesterday. But you can find it. You can go into the lighthouse for free. Last year, we were greeted with an angry neighbor who had an ax. But that was dispensed with uh, in the morning. And we were able to go forward. It's just very tricky. I, honestly, we are a nice group. And we're not annoying. But uh, we, when our campaign was launched, you see we have that painting in our museum. And we had it on the front of our newsletter. We sold those little buttons. That, that picture you saw was, a, was the button that we sold for $10 to raise money for the lighthouse. Two of the first people to come and buy the button were postal workers. Because it turns out, um, oh, let go forward a little bit. We were selected. Our lighthouse was selected to be the Connecticut lighthouse in the US uh, Postal Service series of New England lighthouses. We had known about it for some time, um, but it was a big secret. So coincidentally. Lee, the same time we announced our uh, campaign to repaint the lighthouse, we had this terrific stamp doing a lot of the work for us. That was really great. We did the announcement. This was, let's see, we, this is that pin. We did the announcement and the pin on something like June 26th or 7th, uh, 2013, and had a little press conference down at the lighthouse to which basically nobody came. But it a little, I don't know if you remember Patch. It was the AOL news service online. Somebody came from Patch, and they put it on the, uh, on the online newspaper the next day. And we got a call from the secretary of the Carpenters Union. And she said, you want to repaint the lighthouse? Well, we have painters. The union is next door. We have carpenters. And we know people with scaffolding. We'll just donate it all. And they did, uh, probably $400,000 worth of work. It's phenomenal. We are small, 
We are poor, but we are the luckiest group you're ever going to find. Honestly, we are. And so there we are with the head of the Carpenters Union and two people from Brand Scaffolding who, who really came through and gave us the scaffolding. Uh, the day of the conveyance ceremony, which was like two weeks later for Race Rock Lighthouse, it was so foggy we couldn't even find the lighthouse for a few minutes. But we had a, what you do is you have a very formal ceremony where the Coast Guard hands over the keys. We had all our local representatives and the head of the Coast Guard Academy. And we went out with the press to take pictures of the lighthouse and they couldn't find it. It's kind of funny. But that's why it's important, right? Of your foghorn. Um, there's a stamp. And here's, here's uh, Andrea Stillman, the head of the post office, our mayor, uh, the head of the US Coast Guard Academy, and myself at the Custom House for a ceremony. Uh, and as I said, we have our volunteers who are always out when there's an event in, in New London, selling our buttons, getting new volunteers, trying to get people interested in the museum. Uh, at the same time, it's hard to believe, at the same time, we no sooner got through that, the announcement came out, and it wasn't expected, it wasn't expected, that Ledge Light was up for adoption. And we had just taken on Race Rock, we had just lost Little Gull, well, there was nothing we could do about that. But Ledge Light is everyone's favorite lighthouse, I have to say, in any of the news programs, this, you get the same ones in Connecticut, they use this when they show the weather, it's always ledge light in the summer. And uh, what could we do but apply? These are the, the heads of the ledge light foundation, the Gibsteins, who live over in Groton. And uh, the ledge light foundation is a friends group. It's just a bunch of uh, regular people who, since the Coast Guard left the lighthouse unmanned, which is probably the 1980s, the ledge light foundation has done the work of maintaining it. And lately, they've put exhibits inside it and run tours to it, but they don't own it. All of a sudden, the lighthouse was up for ownership, and the Ledge Light Foundation asked us if we would pair with them as sort of the umbrella. We have the, fin well, I know that we have the finances, but compared to a bunch of individuals, we have a financial plan, we have a preservation track record, an educational plan with the kids, all the things that um, the Park Service looks at, the National Park Service are the ones who uh, grade the applications. Again, we were, we were, um, we applied uh, against uh, a college and a couple of other organizations who were very serious and we won. So this summer, we will take ownership formal ownership at one of, with one of those ceremonies on the three major beacons and three of the finest lighthouses, really, in, in the country. We'll have all three of them. And uh, we're hoping to do the ceremony on uh, August 7th, which is US Lighthouse Day, which is the day that this, um, well, we're hoping the conveyance ceremony is on US Lighthouse Day. And we're actually hoping that the Secretary of the Interior comes because what we have is unprecedented. One group with three you know, fabulous lighthouses. Now, and this is paid for by FEMA, so we have handicapped access. If we could get people by our easement to get to the handicapped access, you could get someone with difficulty walking or even in a wheelchair into the bottom of the lighthouse, and that's quite a nice thing, and where else can you do that? It's a very beautiful sight, but we've, you know, we're doing a good job. This is the wall that was so uh, destroyed by Superstorm Sandy. Here's our mason, uh, Harold Heffel, taking down the old wall, and here's the new wall. Our plan was to walk on the outside because we actually have a three-foot strip, but that's where the lawsuit is about going by their swimming pool. So who even knows? But the idea is that the kids walk down the side on the left, my left, your right, and they sit on that beautiful um, uh, walkway, which is all stone that was donated by the city, used curbing, used granite curbing. And they can look out at the harbor and learn about 
uh, like I said, geology, the harbor, aids to navigation, all the local maritime history. So we're thinking someday that's going to work out. And here are the Carpenters Union members. Look at that. And there's the scaffolding going up. It was quite phenomenal, quite phenomenal. And we thought painting was the difficulty. No, no, no. It was the masonry. When they got up there, the masonry was, uh, well, you'll see a picture of it. Anyway, this is our poster from last year's Sentinels on the Sound. Okay. Here are our volunteers setting up to do boat tours early in the season. And there are the boat tours. What we do is we take lo local um, captains with their boats, whatever funky boats they have. They have licenses to take out six people at a time. So we pay the captain $100. And if we fill the boat with six people, we make about $110. And we give tours right out to the lighthouses. And it's uh, really fun. It's really local. And it's, uh, it's what won the Yankee Magazine Best Tours. Um, and here is how the lighthouse looked. Actually, it was tented all the way up to the cupola, all the way up to the lantern at the top. We also do sunset and uh, nighttime tours, full moons are popular, but when there's, no, when there's no light at all, it's phenomenal. A lot of people are boaters around the area, but they don't take their boats out at night, and it's such a different experience. And in uh, August, the water just calms down, and it's like glass, and it's a very beautiful thing to be out there at night. It's a, you know, we're an educational organization. Education is what we try to do. And everything we do, we try to teach people about caring for Long Island Sound, you know, historic preservation. So any sort of uh, way we can get people out on the water, we consider a success. So we really knock ourselves out with these tours. Um, we also, last year, did uh, nine tours to Plum Island for the day. They were extremely popular. Um, we are now co-plaintiffs against our friends at the GSA who just gave us three lighthouses to help prevent the sale of Plum Island. We'll see what happens. All I know is this year they're only giving us one tour. Um, so it's going to be on August 4th, and there's no charge if you, if you want to sign up for it. When they got to the top of the lighthouse, the big surprise was wherever there was uh, cast iron, and the cast iron lantern and the windows, et cetera, were put in probably in the 1860s. The uh, difference of contraction and expansion over the years allowed water to get in there, ice to form, and to push things apart and really do a job. So uh, this is just underneath the lantern where that black strip is, all the masonry was kind of shattered. And you know, how do you get up there to see? You, you, we don't have a ladder or anything, and the windows certainly don't open. So it was, uh, we have fixed it all. Here is around a window where they were cutting out the masonry and the fractured stones. Some of the brownstone surrounding the windows, which is what that little black section is uh, over to the side. Uh, the brownstone surrounding it had fractured uh, vertically. So every year when the water got in, it pushed out further and further. Some of the stones were pushed out at the top as far as four inches. So those pieces, any day, any year, would have fallen off the lighthouse. So our masons are very uh, proud of what they do. And they hand cut stones to replace those brown stones because they said uh, in another uh, 200 years, when somebody has to fix their work, they don't want them to think they uh, didn't do it right. So at the same time, we took a, an architect, a preservation architect, out to Race Rock, and we started 
you know, the, the process, you don't just go out and work on the lighthouses. You have to have architects and historic preservationists give you a plan and you go through step by step. So we had done that with uh, Harbor Light. We were, we were ready for the restoration. So we started with Race Rock too. It's very hard to land there. There is no, uh, it's almost impossible to land there. And uh, because the, the turbulent waters had knocked over the riprap, which made a little landing area. So when we would go in with the Coast Guard, and, and frankly, we'd only been there a couple of times before we took ownership of it, the Coast Guard is there with somebody gunning the engine and keeping us from being dashed into the rocks while you're on the moving boat and you have to go onto a totally vertical metal ladder, to sort of jump up there and climb up. It's not like we can bring the public out there yet. So we got, we got Rick out there and we started doing the, uh, the preservation plan. And what happened? We got a call from National Geographic last summer, in June. And they said they wanted to film at Race Rock. And I said, wait a minute. It would be so much easier if you wanted to film at Ledge Light, you know, the brick one, because we can land there and it's clean. This place was full of dead pigeons and guano and lead paint, like curls all over the wall. It's quite a mess. Uh, and uh, they said, no, no, we want someone to live at uh, Race Rock for four weeks this summer. I said, it's hard to get to. And they said, well, we're National Geographic. We can get anywhere. Even though, you know, when you're at Race Rock, it's like Times Square. You have all the fishermen. You have everybody going by. Uh, Fisher's Island is right next door. But to land there is not easy. It's the race, and it's difficult. But in fact, they did it. And even though the television program, <clears throat> here is the, here's another, here's, here's the person they put out there, Brooks Kuhn. Um, the premise was that we, the Maritime Society, had hired a, a jack of all trades carpenter to go out there and work on the lighthouse. And they took pictures of her. They had cameras in every room, so it was kind of creepy watching her do things in the lighthouse. That was the premise, and it was, it was what it was. But what we got in exchange was not money, but they cleaned up the whole lighthouse with HEPA vacuums and licensed people. They took out the dead pigeons, the guano, the, the lead paint on the walls and disposed of it properly. And how would we do that? How would we do that, our little organization? So even though the, the program was really, I have to say, a bitter disappointment. In fact, in the midst of that other uh, all-consuming restoration going on on shore, we had uh, Race Rock brought up, to, brought up to snuff to the degree where we can actually bring in somebody now and not feel horribly embarrassed because it's um, uh, so filthy. Here is a picture of the upstairs attic. The windows were out, the guano you can see on the floor. When they left, look at that, all cleaned up. Very nice, all new uh, uh, Lexan uh, put in the windows so that the birds will never get in again. They even found two chimneys behind the, uh, the siding, you know, like the for mica that in the end the Coast Guard had put up on the walls and the plaster, they found the chimneys where the coal stoves had hooked up. So it's really exciting and fun. And uh, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing quite as much fun as these lighthouses, I have to say. We have an exhibit at our museum. This is a picture inside the light, uh, um, custom house. We actually have had for many years the original Fresnel lens from Ledge Lighthouse. So it makes sense now that we actually own the lighthouse. Well, nobody owns the lenses, I have to say. The lenses all remain the property of the US Coast Guard. They loan it to us. That tall cone on the side is actually the original foghorn, I think, to Harbor Light. When Ledge Light was built in 1909, they moved the foghorn offshore to, um, to Ledge Light. And then this actually belongs to Mystic Seaport. So I have to say, our, our community is very friendly and we share things in a really remarkable way. Last year, for instance, 
the lighthouses are one part of what we do. We do all kinds of programs. We have um, a lecture series sort of like this called the Jaboom Club, which is named for a club formed in New London by former whalers. You know, they like to get together. And uh, last year when the Morgan was at New London, the Morgan, where did it sail from? Did not sail from Mystic, because it can't get out the Mystic River, right? Had to be motored over to New London, the whaling city, ballasted, and it sailed out of New London. Then it sailed back to New London. And when it was in New London, we did a parade. And this is our funky little parade. It was so great. And our group up at the top recreated the Jaboom Club floats that these uh, original whalers had when they had their parade every year, you know, from about 1880 until about 1950. And then we had a chowder fest, which is what they did too. This year, what have we got? We've got the Amistad. How could we be so lucky? Well, the Custom House is, was the Custom House. And when the Amistad in, in 1839 was intercepted off of Montauk Point, it was brought into where? New London Custom House. The ship remained in New London the whole time it was in Connecticut for, uh, I, I don't know, 16 months until the end of the Supreme Court trial. And when the captives were set free, our custom house, that building, which had only been open three or four years at that point, auctioned off the ship and auctioned off the other goods that had been in the hold. So we have been, despite what the Amistad did or did not do, we always loved the ship coming to New London. And in past years, it's only been there for a couple of days here and there, you know, because they had their own life. But this year, we were actually asked by the receiver. Amistad, you probably know, is in bankruptcy, you know, is in court right now. Um, we were asked to arrange the school visits and to host the Amistad uh, from May through October. So at our museum, we have a uh, large, our largest permanent exhibition is an exhibit on the Amistad. And one other thing, when we put that exhibit in, we detoured for three weeks and we brought it to the UN, the lobby of the UN in New York. Every year they do a commemoration of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, which was about 1807 or 1808. And beginning in 2008, they've commemorated that act and taken a big initiative about slavery around the world. And uh, in 2010, we took our little custom house, took an exhibit to the UN, and it was quite a fantastic thing. So we have strong ties with the Amistad. We love it. And this was the welcome ceremony that we had um, a week ago, Friday, for the ship. Um, we also, last Tuesday, invited the leading Amistad scholar uh, the man in the light shirt on the sofa sitting next to Kip Bergstrom, um, Marcus Redeker, to the museum to help. Uh, he's done a lot of research in Africa and with the story of the captives before they got to Connecticut and once they returned to Africa. And you, it was an interesting because you wouldn't think with all the wars and upheaval they've had in Sierra Leone, you wouldn't think you'd find anything, and he found loads of information. He's put the Africans back as the hero of the story, and uh, so we invited him to New London, and we invited all, if you know who those people are, all the leading uh, historians in the state and the people with Amistad sites, and we facilitated that great meeting on Tuesday. You know, it, this was not a, a public thing. It was a private educational thing. And w when we asked Marcus Redeker to come, he said, I'll be there next week. And that was great. He's a real activist himself. We also do, you might see in the newsletter, uh, other types of programs. The museum is open four hours a day from 1 to 5. But during the day, we try to fill it. And this is a wonderful uh, 
musician, uh, Jin Hee Kim, who with the Fairfield Chorale, I think last year, did an original piece of music to commemorate the uh, end of the Vietnam War, which was based on the woman in the picture, you know, the little girl who was on fire, that horrible picture. She worked with that woman who now lives in Canada and is a peace activist and created a new piece of music that was that premiered here in Fairfield County. Um, she does a music meditation class, and this is just showing one of them. We have that starting up in June again. It's a wonderful um, original thing. We have cartooning classes. We started with a show, and maybe you know from Westport, uh, the daughter of the man who illustrated uh, Little Toot. You know Little Toot, that book? Uh, Hardy Gramatke. His uh, daughter lives in Westport, and she loaned us all those drawings, and that was probably in about 2009, and every year since then we've been doing uh, cartooning classes. Those start in July. In August, like I said, August 7th, we're kind of hoping we can get the Secretary of the Interior, who knows, but our conveyance ceremony will take place for um, uh, New London Ledge Light, which is really exciting. Everybody loves Ledge Light. And this is our poster for this year, and I just took out Saturdays and Sundays at the top because it's actually 19 weeks of activities, not just the weekends. We have partnerships uh, with the Florence Griswold Museum, with the Connecticut River Museum. In New London, it's Coast Guard Summer, and everything we do is Coast Guard. The Customs was founded the year before the Coast Guard, or the Revenue Cutter Service, which became the Coast Guard, as a part of U.S. Customs. So everything to do with the Coast Guard, including that fabulous new museum they're hoping to build in New London someday, we will be their best partner because their history is our history. And of course, the, um, the main thing for us remains access and education. And here are the kids up there. Um, the first, you know, I'd been into the Lighthouse, of course, many times before we took, or s several times before we started taking the school children in. But when they came up that first morning, at nine o'clock when the, when, the, when the kids came over, I had never been there at that moment, and the rainbows were being formed through the lens. It was just at the right angle. And it seems like we're doing the right thing. That seemed like a sign to say, we're doing the right thing with these lighthouses, and the kids absolutely love it. And we have wonderful community support. So I hope you'll all come out and visit the Custom House. We have all kinds of programs, like I said, 19 weeks of uh, activities relating to the Lighthouse this summer. And uh, thank you for coming here today on this beautiful day. I will say the, um, the Lighthouse Pass program, we have that in New London too, and, and it's great for people. They can go all over the place with their families and get the pass, which allows them to go in to all these different sites. So I'm glad you have it, and I'm happy to be here. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Yeah? What does it cost to maintain a lighthouse? Well, that's an interesting question, because for most of the time, it's like nothing, right? It's a very self-contained building. We get the Coast Guard every year. Coast Guard cadets are our backbone. They come out, they clean it. They, uh, we get the Sea Scouts. They fix up the property. It's really not anything you have to do. Then every 10 years, we hope 20 years, you have to paint it. The, that, however, we did it, right? In one year, in one year, we raised the money to do the whole restoration for that lighthouse. We raised about $160,000 from contributions. We, were, we had donated to us about $400,000 in in-kind contributions, the scaffolding, 50% off on this special paint. You know, it, it's not, we want to build a dock, right? We, because we have no other access to our lighthouse right now. We don't want to freak out the neighbors any more than we have to, so we want to recreate the historic dock that went out on the, the water side of the lighthouse. And to do that, it's probably, 
maybe $200,000. We were hoping to get a grant. The grants disappeared with the state. You know, we get, no, we get no regular support from anybody, from the state, the federal government, or from the city of New London, but people help us when we can, and there was a special fund for um, nonprofit historic sites where we thought we'd get $100,000 towards the dock, which has disappeared. And um, so if you do something, you know, it costs a lot. The Ledge Light Foundation, um, uh, had a fundraiser five years ago when they were when they didn't own it, and they raised about twenty thousand dollars, which has lasted them to this day. They've gotten donation of windows, and they've replaced almost all the windows. They had rec uh, donations of carpet tiles, which they put over the uh, linoleum, which was an asbestos kind of linoleum. So to just seal that, that was all donated. They put in three rooms of it just over the last weeks. Um, so their costs, you know, they apply for little grants. The cost, the cost will be if the bumper around the bottom has to be replaced or the foundation, when that's like out of sight, what that would be to fix. But um, in a year-to-year -year sense, you look at Race Rock, nothing has been done at Race Rock for 30 years, and uh, that is every year nothing has been done. Last year, we never would have tackled it the first year we owned it. We got National Geographic. The whole huge, probably couple, really like $50,000 of cleaning work was done as a, as a donation for using it as a film site. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. The easiest thing in the world seems to be to get lighthouses restored. <laughs> it's just funny because people love them so much. Um, the museum, on the other hand, and the day-to-day the -day expenses, that's where our difficulty is. But with the lighthouses, there's so much goodwill. It, I don't know. It, it takes work, but we have the support. Any other questions? Yeah? So how do you access No, no, the, the Harbor Lighthouse, we only take six people up inside the lighthouse at a time because it's quite small. So we drive three miles from the Custom House. We meet at the Custom House. We drive three miles along the shore to the lighthouse, park on the street. We walk on our strip of land that leads right to the water. But there's a big wall there. You saw the wall. The wall was... Um, is considered historic. Even though we replaced it with granite, it marks a building where foghorns were tested by the Dabol family, who were engineers, and they did a famous almanac out of uh, New London. And so that's a historic configuration. So we walk there, and how do we get to our lighthouse? Well, we can walk on the side of the wall except for the injunction, or we can walk across the back of the house, which is our, our easement of necessity. We could use our riparian rights, but as you see, we're getting slammed on all sides. So I don't, know, I, I don't really know. There was a, a, a young woman who graduated as a NOAA officer from the officer's school they have at the Coast Guard Academy. They have um, a small group of NOAA candidates who go to school at the U.S. Coast Guard. She graduated on Wednesday. What she wanted to do was go to the lighthouse. So on Thursday afternoon, I took uh, this, this young woman and her family to the lighthouse, and we went on the path. Nobody saw us. I mean, it's our path. Come on. But we went up in the lighthouse. We accessed it by foot. Uh, it, it should be not an issue, but it is. Um, so that's how we do it. Uh, the other two lighthouses, you have to go by boat. Uh, Ledge Light, there's a, there's a company, not a company, a nonprofit called Project Oceanology in Groton at the Yukon Avery Point campus that has these things they call big blue boats, and they carry about 50 people. And in the summer, they do three trips a week to Ledge Light that anybody can go on. It's $40. And uh, you can take it from New London on Sundays and from Avery Point on 
Tuesdays, I think, and Saturdays. And you go out and you get to go in the lighthouse. They have videos. The Gibsteins I showed you, Todd Gibstein himself actually worked for National Geographic for 20 years and still teaches for them, gives seminars and things. And he's a great photographer and filmmaker. And he's made a film about the creation of ledge light. So you go in, you have exhibits, you have the film, and you can go all the way up to the lantern. It's a nice trip. Harbor Light is 119. Ledge Light, I don't know. But Harbor Light is the tallest. So actually, Little Gull is taller, but it's on a platform. So if you just measure the lighthouse, you know, we, we skew our facts to suit our purposes. So uh, the focal plane from Little Gull is higher, but the lighthouse itself is up on a concrete platform. So the lighthouse is actually smaller. And you would say Montauk Point is actually larger, older, but we don't consider that part of our definition of Long Island Sound. So we do what we can. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, thank you. You're really good to be here. Thanks. Thank you.